So today we're going to be continuing with our organic chemistry unit and we're going to be covering unsaturated hydrocarbons part one. So previously we discussed saturated hydrocarbons that only consist of single bonds between atoms. Now we're going to introduce unsaturated hydrocarbons. Unsaturated hydrocarbons have at least one double or triple bond. In other terms, uh, the molecule is not bonded to the maximum number of hydrogens possible. Unsaturated hydrocarbons can be divided into two categories. The first is alkenes and the second is alkynes. So at first we have alkenes. Alkenes contain at least one double bond and their general formula can be written as CnH2n, where n is an integer. Next we have alkynes and alkynes contain at least one triple bond and their general formula is CnH2n minus two. Now these formulas only apply to structures where there's only one uh, double or triple bond, but it is possible that we can have multiple types of these bonds in one structure. Furthermore, we can find a double or triple bond in a chain or ring structure. So in general, there are two groups that we can classify hydrocarbons as, aliphatic and aromatic. Aliphatic hydrocarbons are any hydrocarbons that are straight chains, branch chains, ring structures, or non-aromatic rings. So this includes all the hydrocarbons we've already seen. So our alkanes, alkynes, and our alkenes. We will discuss aromatic hydrocarbons in a further video. So when we're naming alkenes and alkynes, the rules we're gonna use are really similar to the ones for alkanes. First, we're gonna to have to identify the longest carbon chain with a double or triple bond in it. This is gonna be our parent chain. Next, we're going to number the carbon chain such that we assign the carbon that has a double or triple bond with the lowest number. If you find that the carbon with the double or triple bond is exactly in the middle of the compound, then you're going to number it so that the chain starts from the end that's closer to a substituent group. Third, we're going to have to identify if there's any substituent groups present and what carbon they're attached to. And so when we assemble the final name, of course, you're going to put your substituent groups first and their carbon number. And then to end the word, we'll have to include the prefix for the parent chain, as well as indicate what type of bond is present in the compound and where it's present in the compound. If there's a double bond, you're going to end the name with E-N-E -E or E-N. And if there's a triple bond, you're going to end the name with Y-N-E -E or E-N. If there's more than one double or triple bond, similar to how we named uh, plurals of substituent groups, you have to include a plural prefix before the suffix. So that could mean that your ending would become diene or triene. All right, so here I have two examples for alkenes. The first one is going to be a drawing example for 2,5-dimethylhep3-ene. So the parent chain is going to be seven carbons long, we can identify that from the root of the end of the word. So we can just go ahead and draw in a seven carbon long chain. There we go. I've also gone ahead and numbered the carbon chain, so it's going to be easier for us to identify which carbon we need to use. I started on the left side, but again, you can start from the right side as long as you're consistent with your number and you'll end up with the same result. So up next, we want to indicate where our double bond is. Here we can see that it is a double bond because it has an E and E ending, and it's going to be at the third position. So right between carbon three and four, we're just going to draw another line to indicate that it's a double bond. Now we also have to include our substituent groups. We see here that there's going to be two methyl groups at the two and five position. So here at carbon two, I'm just gonna draw one straight line. There's our first methyl group. And then a second straight line at carbon five, that's our second methyl group. And that concludes the structure for 2,5-dimethylhep3-ene. And for the second example, we have a naming one. So at first, we wanna identify the parent chain. Here, it's a little more obvious. There's only one carbon chain present, and it's five carbons long. So we know for the parent chain prefix, we're going to use pent. Next, we're going to want to identify where the double bonds are. Here, we can see that there's a double bond at this position and at this position. 
and we're also going to need to number the carbon chain so that the double bonds are attached to the carbon with the lower number. If we start from the left side, then the first double bond would be at carbon 2, but if we start from the right side, then the first double bond would be at carbon 1. So it makes more sense to start numbering it from the right side. So we just go ahead and write those in for clarity's sake. And then we're going to want to identify if there's any substituent groups present. In this structure, there are none. So we can skip this step for now and go ahead and assemble our name. So there's two possible ways to name this structure. The first way is we include the parent chain prefix first, which is pent. Then we include the position of each double bond. So it's one, three. And then we end it with diene. Now remember your plural prefix di because there are two double bonds present in the structure. But there is another way we can write this. So in this way, we include the position for the double bond before the parent chain prefix. So then it would be 1,3 pentadiene. So the only difference here really is the position of where our uh, numbers are going to be. But that's essentially how we number this chain. Okay, so now I have two examples for alkynes. The first one is going to be a drawing example for 3,3-diethyl-octuanine. So first we're going to go ahead and identify our parent chain. Here we have the prefix oct, which is the prefix for an 8-carbon chain. And we also have Y and E ending, which means that there's only one triple bond present in the structure. And furthermore, we have the number one here, which corresponds to the position of the triple bond. So we already have kind of the backbone of the structure assembled. So we're going to go ahead and draw that in. Here's our triple bond. This is going to act as carbon one. And this is going to act as carbon two at the other end of the triple bond. And we're just going to draw a straight line from carbon two to three, because when you're working with structures that have triple bonds in them, instead of having a curve at the triple bond, it's technically incorrect because the bond angle is 180 there. So you're going to want to draw a straight line from carbon one to two to three in this scenario. And we're just going to keep going and finish the structure. So there we have our carbon backbone. And I've also just gone ahead and included the numbering for this chain. And so next we're gonna to wanna to add in our substituent groups. So here we know that we have two ethyl groups and we know that they're both going to be at the third position. So let's just go ahead and draw that on our structure. Here's carbon three that I've included below. So we're just going to draw the first ethyl group indicate that there's two carbons in that chain and the second ethyl group at the same location. And just like that, we've drawn the full structure for 3,3-diethyl-oct-1-ene. And now let's move on to our second example, which is a naming example for the structure on the right. So first thing we want to do is identify the parent chain that contains our triple bond in it. So it's going to be this chain right here. And let's count the number of carbons. There's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this parent chain. So we know the prefix we're going to use is hex. Now we're going to want to identify where the triple bond is present in the structure. Here on the left side, we see that there's a triple bond directly attached to carbon one. So this one's a little more obvious. It wouldn't make sense to start from the right side because then the carbon would be attached to carbon five, which is not the correct answer. So here we know that it's gonna be at the first carbon. Next, we're gonna to wanna to identify any substituent groups. Here we see that we have one methyl group at the third carbon position. Go ahead and write that in. So we're also going to have to include that in our final naming. And with that information, we can go ahead and name our structure. 
So first, let's include our substituent group. We have 3-methyl. And next, we're just going to put in our parent chain, which is hex. Then we're going to want to include the position of the triple bond, which is at 1. And finally, we're going to need to include the suffix for a triple chain, triple bond in a chain, is ein. So there we have 3-methylhex-1-ein. Remember, we can also write it a second way where the beginning stays the same, but we switch the position of the one to the beginning right before hex. And there we would have 3-methyl-1-hexene instead. So now we're going to introduce a new type of isomer. Here we have cis and trans isomers, and they arise when we're dealing with alkenes. So because there's a double bond, the atoms around the carbons, they can't rotate freely like they could in an alkane. As a result, the position that each atom is in relative to the double bond remains fixed. And so this allows us to have what are known as stereoisomers. So stereoisomers are compounds that consist of the same atoms and the same structure, unlike when we had structural isomers. But the difference is their atoms will differ in terms of their spatial arrangement. So with alkenes, we can have two types of stereoisomers, cis and trans isomers. A trans isomer is one where the longest alkyl groups are on opposite sides of the carbon double bond. And so this makes sense to us because the word trans kind of means transverse or different. And a little trick to remember this or to identify this in a molecule is by drawing a horizontal line straight through the double double bond and here we can see when we do that for this example, we have one alkyl group up here and one alkyl group up here. They're on different sides of the horizontal line. Therefore, we have a trans isomer in this scenario. Now, cis isomers have the longest alkyl groups on the same side of the carbon double bond. And this also makes sense because the word cis means the same. So again, we can draw a horizontal line right through the middle of the compound. And there we can see that we have two alkyl groups both on the same side, which indicates that it's a cis isomer. So finally, when we're naming these structures, we have to include whether the molecule is trans or cis at the very beginning of the name before we even write any of the substituent groups. So you just directly write the word trans or cis depending on which one it is. And we separate this from the rest of the word using a hyphen. All right, guys, so I have two examples for cis and trans isomerism. The first one, we're going to want to name the structure on the left here. So first, let's identify the parent chain. It's just going to be five carbons long. So we know that the prefix we're going to use for the parent chain is pent. We're also going to want to number the carbon chain such that the double bond is attached to the carbon with the lowest possible number. This is achieved if you start numbering it from the left side so that the double bond is going to be attached to carbon two. And now we're gonna to wanna to determine whether it's a cis or trans isomer. So again, we can just draw a straight horizontal line through the middle and determine where the alkyl groups are relative to this line. So we have the first group, the methyl group, on the bottom part of the, on the bottom half. And then we have the second alkyl group, which is an ethyl group on the top half. Since we see that these two groups are on opposite sides, we can determine that this structure must be trans. And we will include that in our final naming as well. There's no substituent groups present here, so we don't have to worry about that. And so finally, we're gonna assemble the name. So first you have to put that it is trans at the very beginning, include your hyphen, and then we're just going to put together the rest of it. So here's our parent chain prefix, pent, the position of the double bond, which is two, and then the proper E and E suffix for an alkene. And that, with that, we have the final name as transpent2ene. And next, we're going to want to draw the uh, 
structure for cis-3-methylhex-3-ene. So to do that, we're just going to start, to make this easy, we're going to first draw the carbon double bond, and then we'll do the rest of our portrait kind of around that. So since we know it's cis, we know that both the longest alkyl groups are going to be on the same side. So we can draw the, you know, the horizontal line. You don't have to, but it does make it easier to understand. And from the name, we also know that we are going to have one substituent group, which is a methyl group on the third carbon here. So we can go ahead and draw that in. We can just start drawing from one side. And then we're also going to have carbon one and two of the actual parent chain here, because here we have carbon three and four. So you would draw in this here. And now when you're comparing those two groups, the carbon chain at the bottom is longer than the methyl group at the top. So you know that since it's a cis isomer, the longer chain on the right side is also going to have to be at the bottom half. And on the right side, all we have is the rest of the parent chain, which is going to be carbon five and six. And there's also going to be one hydrogen bonded to the carbon here because it doesn't indicate that there's any other substituent groups. So we're gonna draw the hydrogen there because it's not an alkyl chain. It's always gonna be, um, lower priority than the actual alkyl chain and then we'll just draw in the rest of the structure and just like that this is the structure for cis 3 methyl hex 3 ene and that concludes part one of unsaturated hydrocarbons